All right. Um, let me say I have given a number of online talks and the Zoom and PowerPoint seem to have a problem. So I might have some skipping back and forth and I'm sorry about that. Sometimes it skips the next slide. Anyway, my idea is that my talk today will be an overview of how my uh, thinking and understanding uh, about self-control developed uh, over time uh, as research kept uh, bringing in uh, new ideas and new findings to change what I thought. Uh, first of all, some basic background. What is self-control? Well, I think a simple way to understand it is that it overrides. Uh, it changes yourself. So you have one response, uh, but with self-control, you can stop that response and instead respond differently. It can refer to thoughts that you start to have. But if you have self-control, you can stop that thought and think about something else and uh, so on with uh, other phenomena. The word regulate is often used as in self-regulation. Uh, and I like that word because it means not just change, but change based on an idea. The ideas are called standards about what you should and should not do. Um, so when the government regulates how buildings are made, it, it doesn't just say make them differently, but it says there are rules. When the building is made, it has to have doors and windows and the heating system has to work and, uh, and, and so forth. So in the same way, when you control yourself, you change based on uh, culture's ideas uh, and your own personal ideas of how you, you want to be. It's vital for human social life because uh, culture works for us. It's a successful system to Im increase life and improve life, uh, but it only works if most people do their jobs, fulfill their roles, obey most of the rules most of the time. And so self-control helps us do that to change what we want to do to go along uh, with the rules that make culture possible. Um, Self-regulation is probably more advanced in humans than in others, but it, it traces back to motivational conflict. When you want two different things at the same time, uh, you use self-control uh, to choose one of them and to enforce one and to st suppress or hold back uh, the other. I got into self-control research uh, because some of the leading thinkers when I was a younger scholar were saying that self-control, it's not just one more thing that the self does, it's really the key uh, to how the self works in general. It's the most important uh, single thing. And I set myself the project of trying to understand the human self. Uh, so I thought, well, I better learn uh, about self-regulation and self-control uh, since that's uh, so important. Uh, it applies to other issues as well. Morality, of course, often means not doing what you might selfishly feel like doing in the present so as to do what's best for society. Uh, obviously, that depends heavily uh, on self-control. And so self-control uh, is really vital to morally good behavior. Uh, there's also uh, issues of free will uh, discussed in some circumstances. I've been thinking about that recently. Uh, and uh, self-control is certainly an important part of that. If nothing else, if you do not act on your immediate impulse, that creates the freedom so you can do something different. The value of self-control uh, is, uh, well, there are two reasons to study it. One is, as I did, because it's a, can see a key to understanding the self, uh, to developing a theory of self. But another reason is for practical benefits. Self-control really makes life better for many people. I contrast this with self-esteem, uh, which I studied early in my career to a, a great uh, extent. Uh, we thought, many of us thought for a long time that self-esteem would be uh, the key to success in life because people who are more successful have higher self-esteem uh, than other people. Um, and in many respects, low self-esteem was associated with many problems and failures in life. So we thought, well, let's, let's uh, make, raise people's self-esteem and then things will happen better for them. Only you know, the results were disappointing. It seems 
self-esteem is more a result than a cause. When they tracked people over time, um, self-esteem tended to come later than the good outcomes. So it's not a cause of them. For example, it was true uh, that students in school who are doing better, who have better grades, more success in school, they have higher self-esteem uh, than other students. Well, Americans are always looking for a way uh, to help students learn better without having to do all that extra studying and homework. And so we thought, well, this is great. High self-esteem goes with doing well in school. So raise children's self-esteem and they'll do well in school. And it was only when they tracked people over time, they said, oh, no, it doesn't work like that. Doing well in school comes first and that leads to higher self-esteem later. Uh, in contrast, um, high self-esteem first does not lead uh, to doing uh, better, to getting better grades later. Now, I bring this up because with self-control, it's very different. There, when they track people over time, the self-control comes first and predicts much better outcomes even many years later. Uh, there are studies that uh, test children for their self-control or get their teachers to rate their self-control when the children are 10 years old or eight. Uh, in some cases, like in Walter Michel's famous studies, uh, the children were only four years old. And yet having better self-control at age four predicted better outcomes in adulthood, more success uh, in school, more success in work, including earning a higher salary, People with high self-control have good relationships. They're more popular, more people like them. Their close relationships, their marriages last longer, are more stable. Uh, good self-control doesn't mean just denying yourself and making yourself do it, but you think you should. Uh, rather, people with good self-control are happier. And part of that is they have low stress. Um, much of the problems people have in their life are their own making. Uh, when they cause problems for themselves, well, people with good self-control do not do that very much. And so life goes along much more smoothly. Um, they show better signs of, of adjustment. Psychological adjustment goes with good self-control. Both mental health and physical health are better among people with good self-control. They have fewer problems with money in terms of how much they owe or being able to save money or to live within uh, what they can afford. Behaviorally, they're much better. Uh, people with uh, good self-control commit fewer crimes. Uh, even rating their self-control when they are children uh, predicts uh, whether they're likely to be arrested uh, and put in jail as, a, as adults so many years later. Uh, abuse, prejudice, other things uh, uh, go with, low, uh, with good self-control. And at the far end of life, people with good self-control live longer. Probably they take care better, better care of themselves, of their health, and so on. Um, if you look at the, the bottom line, most, you know, certainly many, and, and probably most of the problems you can identify that people struggle with in today's society, there is some element of self-control problems uh, or failures uh, in them. So self-control really is an important key uh, to success in life. And um, what I say to people uh, who uh, may have children or teachers or coaches or whatever, forget about self-esteem, concentrate on building self-control uh, in the young people. That will really be best for them and for society. To, how does self-control work? Well, uh, there are at least three or four, depending on how you count, um, major aspects for self-control to be successful. And, and self-control can fail because of any of them. First, what I already mentioned, the standards, the ideas of what, how you should be. Uh, your goals, whether they're personal, uh, the rules you may live by, your moral rules and uh, personal standards and so on. Um, this can be a problem. Uh, for example, if there are two parents and they make different rules, then it's difficult for the child to learn how to control itself because the rules are not constant. But when you have clear and stable rules, then, uh, then you can regulate uh, better. Then uh, the second ingredient is monitoring. It's very hard to control 
a behavior if you're not aware of it. I, I, earlier, I used the example of how the government regulates buildings and it makes rules of how do you make buildings. Well, it sends out inspectors to monitor these, to make sure that when a new building is being built, uh, that there really are the right number of doors and windows and that the heating systems work and, and all this. And then the third element in self-control is the capacity to change. Uh, uh, willpower is the traditional uh, term for this. We resisted using it for a long time because in, in psychology, you always worry about adopting a, a popular term. But finally, came persuaded that yes, this is, this is what it's uh, studying. And I will talk mainly about that uh, starting in a minute or two. Of course, motivation is there uh, important. You can see this with the standards, but you, you have to want to uh, exert self-control uh, in order to do it. Otherwise, you might know what other people expect to you. You're aware of the behavior you could change, but why bother? You don't, you don't want to. So the motivation perhaps should be included as the fourth. All right. Well, as I said, uh, several leading thinkers were, were saying that self-regulation is the key to understanding the self. I wanted to understand the self, so I went out and spent a year reading a lot of the research that was available back then on how people control and regulate themselves. There was a lot less uh, back then than there, than there is now, uh, but there was research on how people, let's say, quit smoking cigarettes or uh, diet uh, in order to lose weight or try to uh, restrain their alcohol consumption and, 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 and so on. So, um, I, I read this with uh, not having much of a theory or idea in mind, just looking for patterns. And one pattern seemed to be that uh, it would get worse over time. That when you keep exerting self-control, uh, in the short run at least, uh, it's like you got tired and you weren't as good at it anymore. Uh, also, uh, self-control broke down when there are multiple demands uh, on you. For example, uh, when I studied people who are trying to quit smoking, um, if they would give up and relapse and resume smoking, it often occurred when there was stress, when there was something else, say work demands were very high, uh, or they were struggling in their personal relationships. And so to me, it's something else is taking up their willpower, and they, <coughs> and they don't seem to have enough uh, for self-control to continue not smoking. Uh, more recent studies show that people who are on a diet to lose weight and at the same time they're trying to quit smoking, they do a bad job of both of those. Uh, they tend to smoke and, and eat more than they should, uh, both of them. And they're also unpleasant to be with because they're not controlling their feelings. They are uh, irritable and crabby and get angry easily. Well, again, this suggests the idea that there is a limited supply uh, of energy, of willpower, uh, and to be available for self-control. And when you're using it up or whether you're using it for other things, then you don't have as much as you need uh, for whatever particular is being studied. So uh, with you're trying to not smoke, but you have a limited amount of willpower. And if you're also trying to diet and lose weight, or you're also coping with a very difficult uh, period at work, well, that's taking your willpower and you can't use it uh, as well to keep your, yourself from smoking. So uh, over time, this developed into this theory uh, that we called uh, ego depletion. The, the, the term ego we borrowed from Freud. When, when I began to realize that the idea was that the self, the human self is partly made out of energy, that there's an energy aspect, uh, I wanted to see well, who else has talked about this? And I looked through past theories of the self and almost nobody, Sigmund Freud was the only one way back in the 1920s. He said that the ego, which was his term for the self, the ego was made partly out of energy. And he was kind of vague about where that energy came from and how it worked, but at least, and we're certainly not including the rest of Freud's theories about the self, uh, but at least the idea that the self is partly made out of energy. Um, he had anticipated that. And so here in the 1990s, I was coming back and saying maybe he was right. And, and at the time in the 1990s, this was a very radical idea because then psychology was 
all thinking about information processing models. Everybody liked the idea that the brain is a computer uh, and we look at the inputs and the outputs and what it can process faster and you load one program and, uh, and so on. That's how people were thinking about the mind. I used to make a joke and say that energy theories in psychology energy theories are so far out of fashion that we're not even against them anymore. We don't even, we just completely ignore them. Um, so these ideas, when I first brought them out, uh, they, were, they were fairly radical. Um, as luck would have it, the influx of biological thinking into psychological theory uh, occurred uh, during the 1990s, it was called the decade of the brain. Uh, and that made energy plausible again. I mean, biology, life itself uh, is an energy process uh, and life needs energy to uh, continue. Uh, so um, the idea that psychology, psychological theories can involve energy, um, which when I brought it up seemed, seemed crazy to many people, but it has become a plausible and, and now no one is shocked by that uh, idea. So the essence of this uh, theory was that our capacity for self-control depends on this limited energy resource. Uh, so sometimes you have more than other times and uh, your self-control will change accordingly. When your willpower gets depleted, so you use it up on certain things, then your self-control performance at least will, will be worse, will not, will not do as well. Uh, of course, there are automatic responses and other things that will just work fine, may even take over when your willpower is depleted. But the energy for controlling yourself uh, can, uh, can be reduced, can be de depleted. Uh, later, uh, I'll talk about, we added the idea that this may be connected to the body's energy supply. Uh, the glucose is a chemical in the bloodstream that carries the body's energy to the brain, to the muscles, to all the other organs. Um, and so there are certainly uh, links that we found many times of uh, glucose uh, with self-control. Uh, and later, uh, as I'll also explain, we expanded it. This willpower is used not just for self-control, although self-control, as, as I've said, is extremely important, a key to understanding the self, important trait for being successful in life, so if the willpower energy were only for self-control, that would already make it an important part of the self. Uh, but I've come to realize it was used for other things as well, uh, making decisions and choices, uh, intelligent thought, initiative, planning, uh, and so on. The energy of glucose is also used for a variety of other things. As I said, the whole body operates on it, uh, including the muscles and the brain and the immune system. All right, so if this is true, if there's a limited energy supply, uh, one of my PhD students, Mark Miraven, said, we could test this in the laboratory. Uh, we just need a, a procedure where we deplete some people and not others by having them do a first self-control task. Uh, and then we'll measure their self-control performance on something completely different. Uh, so it doesn't look like it's the same at all, but if both re rely on self-control and this is a general resource, then when it's depleted from the first task, you won't have enough to do well on the second task. Uh, and he ran several of the early experiments, which uh, worked, worked quite well. And uh, indeed it was fortunate for him. He had tried, he'd been in our graduate program for a, a couple of years and his experiments had never worked out that well, but when he started doing ego depletion, uh, they did work well. Uh, and so he stuck with that. And that's uh, indeed very fortunate. I'll describe one of the experiments uh, briefly uh, so you get an idea uh, of how it is. This is not one of, one of Mark's, uh, but uh, uh, it's still, uh, uh, still a good memorable one. So, uh, of course, in, in psychology and in, in those days in particular, you couldn't tell people what part, what aspect of them they are, you're studying because then that changes. So we could not tell people, well, come to the laboratory and we're going to test your self-control uh, because then they would be 
all sensitive to self-control issues and or they might not want to come at all and find out how they did. Uh, so we told them this is an experiment on how well people can remember things that they taste. Uh, and, and we said, because of this, we need you not to eat anything for three hours before the experiment. Anyway, the person comes to the experiment then and maybe has not had lunch or not eaten anything for three hours. What we did next, I guess was a little, a little unfriendly, uh, but it was part of the experiment. We, we baked fresh chocolate chip cookies in the laboratory. We had a, a microwave oven and you know how the microwave blows uh, the, uh, uh, the air out into the, the room. So baking these cookies, they make this delicious aroma. They smelled so good. Um, and so that filled the laboratory with this delicious smell. So anyway, the person comes to our experiment, hungry, skip lunch, and then there's this good, good smell. And then we sit the person at a table and there's a stack of these cookies. And in case they didn't like cookies, we also had some chocolates there. Uh, and also on the table, uh, there is a bowl of radishes. And to some people by random assignment, the experimenter said, well, we wanna study how you remember taste. So we're gonna have you taste some things and you are in the radish condition. Uh, so uh, what I'm gonna need you to do is eat uh, some of these radishes and taste them. Uh, and then don't touch the cookies there for other people in the experiment. So the idea was is we'd get them to want the cookies and they would have to uh, resist that temptation. And we left them alone. Uh, to increase the temptation. Of course, we did not trust them, so we secretly observed people through a, a little uh, uh, hole in the wall. And we saw, yes, they were looking at the cookies and wanting them. People would pick them up and smell them and put them down. But, but nobody ate into the forbidden food uh, and everybody managed to eat a radish. Now we had two control conditions. Uh, one where we told them to eat the chocolate and cookies and not eat the radishes. That does not take self-control. Uh, and then we had a no food control to see if there's anything special when there's no food involved. But the people we were interested in are the ones who had to sit there seeing the cookies and smelling the cookies and wanting the cookies, but instead had to make themselves eat those stupid radishes. And so we did this for five minutes and then that was the end. And then the, the food was cleared away and the the, uh, the next procedure we borrowed from stress research, which is how long do people keep trying and struggling before they give up when, when things are really difficult. You know, we uh, actually created some puzzles that were impossible to, to solve. Uh, the, the subjects thought they were possible. Uh, and we said, well, uh, solve these puzzles, let me know when you're done uh, or, or when you give up and you can't do it anymore. So nobody could solve the puzzles, of course, and we wanted to measure how long do they keep trying. Uh, and uh, as you see, these are quite large results for a laboratory experiment, that five minutes of resisting the temptation in the radish condition of resisting eating cookies when that's what you want, that took 10 minutes off of how long they could make themselves keep persevering and keep trying uh, on those frustrating puzzles. So this fits the ego depletion idea, resisting the temptation of those cookies that took something out of them that was then not there to help them keep working uh, at the puzzles when the puzzles proved uh, difficult. <clears throat> now, many laboratory studies have found this with uh, uh, many different procedures. Um, people don't always get it, but they, they get it a lot. There are hundreds and hundreds of published studies of these uh, with many different procedures. Uh, one thing we worried some years later was, well, it's clear this is a real thing, but is it just in the laboratory? I mean, psychologists can do these things, create these things that happen in the laboratory, but does it happen uh, outside the laboratory in real life? Now, uh, by a sort of accident, I was working with uh, Wilhelm Hoffman, um, uh, and we were collecting data on people's desires. We wanted to see outside the laboratory, how often do people feel desires and how do they respond to them? So we had an, an experience sampling study uh, where uh, we beeped people at random points during the day and asked them, do you have a desire right now? Do you want something? And if so, what? And how strong is the desire? And are you resisting it? And so on. And the study was all finished. And, and, and Hoffman came to me and said, you know, we could test ego depletion 
uh, from these data, we could see if it, if it happens. Uh, obviously, we're only beeping people six times a day and they're not even answering all those. So we're missing a lot. But still, we could tell if they've reported resisting desires earlier, that should deplete their willpower. And then if they resist again, they should be more likely to fail, more likely to give in and do what they're trying not to do. Um, so uh, he computed an index um, that uh, uh, during, during this day, have you reported resisting uh, previous desires? And the more often and the more recently, that was weighted more heavily. And that was uh, taken as a sign of how depleted they were. So that's across the bottom. And then we looked if they reported a later desire, uh, we sorted were they resisting it or not? If you look at the top line, the blue line, well, if you're not resisting it, uh, then whether you do it or not, it doesn't make any difference. It's, it's the same level, uh, no surprise there. Uh, but look at the red line, the, the bottom line. Uh, if you have resisted uh, previous desires, then the next time you resist one, you're more likely to give in. Your resistance gets weaker if you've already resisted. So that's, that's the ego depletion effect. You expended some of your willpower resisting previous desires. Uh, and so you're more likely to fail when you try uh, to resist again. So that was very encouraging to me. Uh, it shows that ego depletion occurs not just uh, in the laboratory under controlled settings, but outside in, uh, in the world. And since then, actually, there have been uh, quite a few findings uh, outside in the real world to indicate as people get depleted, they, they do worse in a whole variety of things. Um, I'm going to. Um, psychology is having a replication crisis, and there are all these uh, arguments about uh, which things are replicated as well. Um, and some people complain they don't replicate ego depletion, but uh, I just I've been doing a literature review on, on replications on multi lab replications, um, and uh, I think you have a pretty strong case that. Uh, partly by accident right now, ego depletion may be the, the one best replicated finding in all of social psychology. Uh, already five years ago, uh, a review found there were 600 uh, published findings uh, significant and, and none in the opposite direction. Some people say, well, it's if you just get lucky and capitalize on chance, but that should work in both directions. Um, it, 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 it always, uh, it's either consistent uh, or it's weak in that uh, direction. And then many different laboratories have found it. Uh, ego depletion has been found in North America and in Europe and in Asia and Australia. Um, those are the main continents that do uh, psychology research. Um, many people I've never met or heard of have found the effect. So uh, I can say, what would it take to be counted as the best replicated finding? Well, you'd need a lot of significant findings. You'd need some pre-registered replications of which uh, there are now several uh, with depletion uh, papers in which everything was uh, pre-registered. Uh, as I said, there are some outside the laboratory increasing number uh, like workers in the hospital, they're supposed to wash their hands uh, between every patient, but they stop doing that as much when it's late in the day and they are uh, they're depleted or physicians prescribe uh, differently when they're depleted, they become more careless or more willing to just give the, the patient whatever they ask for. And last, the focus of our review, the multi-site replications where you get uh, 12 to 15 labs. Uh, it, it turns out in social psychology, these almost never work. Uh, there, there's something like 36 of them that have been published and only four of them were clear successes. One of those was an ego depletion study. Uh, there are two others with kind of mixed evidence, but um, given that hardly anything in social psychology has a successful multi-site replication, that makes makes not very many uh, findings it could compete for the title of the best replicated finding. Anyway, uh, you know, you can argue what's the best and what are the criteria, but uh, from my take on it, the depletion looks very strong. Uh, in terms of replication. Uh, some people fail to get it, but it's usually a failure to manipulate the independent variable. You have to get people to put out the effort so that they become depleted. Uh, and if you do that, then the effects show up uh, quite reliably. 
All right, now I'm gonna to turn to how the theory developed and changed over the years. I, uh, uh, my approach is uh, uh, I wanna end up knowing the truth and I assume I don't know it when I start. Uh, so I think I, I always try to change and improve my theories and pay attention to uh, uh, new data. So when we started, we thought, well, there's a limited amount of energy and then you use it up and then you don't have any. And so that's why you perform worse. That's why ego depletion occurs. Um, I thought maybe this is like muscle tiredness that you exert your muscles and then they get tired and then they don't, don't work that well anymore. Uh, but pretty soon we got some contrary data there. I mentioned Mark Muraven, who did his PhD with me and went on to have a, a fine career as a researcher himself. Uh, he showed that, well, if you make the second task important enough, uh, like if you pay people to do well on it, uh, then you can overcome uh, the depletion effect. So it's not that the brain is out of energy, it still is capable of, of doing it, it's still per capable of performing well. So this changed our theory. It's not that, that the, the fuel, the supply, the energy supply of the brain is gone, it's exhausted, uh, it's just somewhat reduced and then you conserve. So ego depletion is a matter of conserving resources, not that the resources are, are all gone. Uh, and he showed that's why if something important comes along again, you can perform uh, quite well then too. Although when you would test them a third time right after that, and then they were super depleted. So that fits the idea. You're, you've you expended some of your energy, uh, so you naturally conserve it. If there's an important reason to expand it, then you do, but then you're uh, even more uh, depleted. Um, even uh, more recent studies that when people expect future demands on their willpower, they will conserve it now uh, for the sake of the future. So this kind of questioned the muscle model, but then I learned that our physical muscles work the same way, uh, that when you're you guess you have some exercise and your arms or your legs start to get tired. Uh, but if there's something important to do, uh, they can exert just as much power as when they started. Now, there is a point at which your muscles will not do that. You can um, get to the point where the muscle is, is, is so exhausted that it will not function properly. But tiredness comes long before that and is a signal to conserve energy, partly to help you so that you never, uh, you never get uh, to that point. And that makes, that, that brings up an idea in, in terms of how I've developed this, this theory all along, uh, thinking of the capacity for self-control uh, as, a, as, a, as an ability. Um, it's like a physical muscle. So like I said, the depletion effect after you exert the muscle, it gets tired. And the same with after self-control, uh, you get depleted and it doesn't do it well, but it's conservation. You're conserving your energy. So when people have a long way to run, for example, they don't run as fast as they can until they're tired, uh, but rather they conserve their energy and try to make it uh, able to last the whole way. <clears throat> and then the third part of the analogy is, yes, when you exercise your, your physical muscles, they get tired and then they don't want to perform as well. Uh, but if you exercise them regularly, then they do gradually get stronger. Uh, and that's been found with self-control too. Uh, there's just, a, I think a meta-analysis came out in the last year or two uh, of studies, uh, again, on multiple continents showing that regular exercises uh, to build self-control um, actually do work and then they improve self-control and you exercise on one thing and then you test people on something completely different uh, and they do better as a result uh, of those exercises. Uh, this also goes back to the past in the 1800s, the, uh, uh, the British middle class talked about building character, uh, the Victorian period, uh, building character as in making yourself a stronger and better person. And well, that's about what, what these self-control exercises do. They uh, um, make you stronger uh, at uh, mastering yourself. Important point is that the capacity for self-control, you have one resource, uh, one stock of willpower, not a lot of different ones. Some people say, well, I have good self-control uh, for keeping my apartment clean, but I don't have good self-control for getting my work done on time or the other way around. Well, 
It's the same capacity for self-control, but yes, it's limited. So you have to put it onto one thing rather than something else. Uh, and so uh, it does turn out that way, but it's not that you have a different capacity for these things. You have the one capacity and you use it for uh, different areas. And the, the four main ones that have been studied in, in, in self-control, controlling your thoughts, uh, as in making yourself concentrate, making yourself think carefully, trying to shut some thought out of your mind, like a piece of music that keeps popping into your head that you don't like, or maybe thoughts of your former romantic partner that you broke up who was so unpleasant. Uh, anyway, controlling thoughts is one. Uh, emotion control is, is very familiar, uh, trying to restrain your anger, trying to get over your sadness, trying to make yourself cheer up and be happy, uh, and so on. That's quite familiar. Uh, impulse control uh, is probably the best known. Uh, so resisting impulses to eat uh, uh, fattening things or to, again, to smoke cigarettes or drink too much alcohol. Uh, also behavioral ones, impulses to have sex with the wrong person or to uh, behave aggressively uh, towards somebody who bothers you. All these things uh, have to be controlled. And last but not least, self-control, important for task performance, uh, to make yourself do your best work to continue working when you're tired and don't want to persevere, uh, to trade off speed or accuracy, whether you should work faster to get more done or work slower to make sure you don't make mistakes. Uh, all those are, are self-control uh, issues as well. Um, all right, uh, we're doing our time. Um, ego depletion has been applied to a, a whole variety uh, of phenomena. I don't want to go into these uh, at great length or a number of reviews. Uh, that talk about the different things, uh, but ego depletion um, it, you know, applies to careful logical thinking that when people are depleted, they don't think as well. There are many interpersonal things. As I said, people with good self-control have better relationships. And when they get depleted, they treat their partners not as nicely, uh, there's more aggression uh, when people are depleted and so on. Managing money, uh, people whose uh, willpower is depleted will spend more money for the same things. They'll also just impulsively buy things they don't really need or want. Um, so again, the inner, the inner muscle that restrains you and makes you take care of your money uh, doesn't, doesn't work as well. A more uh, immoral behavior as well occurs, and that's been uh, shown as well. All right, let me get to extending the idea. We've talked about self-control and how important this is. Uh, but what about some other domains? <clears throat> so the first big step to me, and, and I was surprised and I didn't know how this would turn out, uh, but that making decisions uh, is depleted. This is sometimes talked about in terms of uh, decision uh, fatigue, that uh, making choices tires you down and, and, then, uh, and then you don't make decisions as, as well as effectively. Uh, here's one of the early experiments we did. Um, we had one group of people make a lot of choices among consumer products. Uh, like, would you rather have a red t-shirt or a blue t-shirt? Would you rather have a, a candle that smells like vanilla or a candle that smells like lemon? And on and on for, I think about half an hour, they made choices. Uh, the, in the no choices condition, they looked at all the same products, they rated them, thought about them and so on, but they did not make decisions. And then the cold presser, that's one of psychology's classic measures of self-control. It's how long can you hold your hand in, in ice water, one degree Celsius. Uh, so it's cold, you put your hand in it, ah, it, it feels bad, you have an impulse to pull it out. So you have to use self-control to do it. And look, uh, the people who had made decisions quit much faster uh, on this test than the people uh, who had not. Uh, made uh, made decisions. So again, making decisions used up some of your willpower, and so you did not have as much available uh, to help you hold your hand in the icy water. Um, some of the effects when you deplete people first, you want to ask how does this affect their decision making? Uh, and a variety of patterns have been found. One is that people just want to not make a decision. Uh, we learned. Uh, I went to some conferences on decision making uh, and research there, and, and they often say, well, suppose you're making a choice between this and that. It might be uh, two computers, and this one has these features, or this one has those features, or two kinds of shoes, or, or, or whatever. Uh, what they don't usually offer is the option of not deciding. 
Whereas real shoppers always have that option. I don't have to buy something today or I can keep looking. So we included that uh, in their procedures. And sure enough, the people who've been depleted by a previous act of, uh, of self-control, they were more likely to say, I don't want to decide. Um, compromise. Uh, Decision-making researchers have said for a long time that compromise is a mentally challenging uh, form of of, of decision making because you have to integrate the different uh, uh, inputs and look for what's sort of the best mixture. Even just price versus quality. Uh, you, you want a certain amount of quality in your product, but you don't want to pay too much. So at what point, if you pay more, you get a higher quality, but at what point do you, you, you choose what's right for you? So people in their natural state will compromise very well, but when they are depleted, they stop compromising. They just pick one dimension and go for the maximum. So again, with the price quality thing, the depleted person will say, just give me the cheapest or maybe just give me the best, uh, but they don't really compromise and trade off. Uh, the third point, often there's a default option. Uh, in many decisions uh, that, uh, well, you can have it your way or just here's the, the way we usually do it. Um, and as people get depleted, they become more and more likely to pick the default option. One of the best studies of this, I was not involved in, but I, I loved it. They, uh, they looked at people who are buying cars. And when you buy an Audi, at least in the United States, uh, these are nice expensive cars. You have a lot of decisions to make about all the different things you could do. Um, and there's often a default option that, well, it comes standard this way, but you can have it any of these other ways if you want to. Uh, well, the, the researchers would just scramble the order of the questions, uh, the, the decisions that people made, and then keep track. And sure enough, whatever the order was, as they went along, they started taking whatever was standard more and more often. They took the default option uh, more and more frequently. Um, Depleted people, also a variation on this is what's called the status quo option, which is status quo is the way things are right now. Uh, so the depleted person says, oh, just leave it the way it is. Don't, don't do anything, don't make any change. Um, not surprisingly, there's uh, impulsive uh, decisions, self-indulgent decisions become more likely when people are depleted. Uh, and uh, there's even some interesting findings on irrational bias. Uh, when you have full possession of your mental powers and have all your willpower, you have a lot of information about a decision. You sort through and you pick the information that's relevant to making a good decision and you ignore the rest. But when people are depleted, they don't do that uh, as well. And so their decisions get biased by some of the things that logically should be irrelevant. Uh, the procedures are a little complicated. I don't want to go uh, bogged down with, uh, with describing them now, but uh, are covered in various review articles. And, uh, anyway, the point is irrational bias increases. So uh, putting these together, uh, decision fatigue or ego depletion and decision making means people shift toward lower effort ways of making decisions. They avoid risks, they don't compromise. Uh, they're not thinking that carefully, you get biased. Uh, they take a short-term bias uh, or they leave things the way uh, they are now. Those are the tendencies of the depleted decision maker. Oh, I guess this picture is getting a little old, but uh, that was one of our recent American presidents uh, looking very nice in his uh, gray suit. Uh, he was being interviewed here uh, and it turned out he wears only gray suits, uh, gray or blue. Um, I think uh, he or probably somebody on his staff read the, the New York Times coverage of our research on decision fatigue and he realized, oh, yes, that's that's true the president has a lot of very difficult decisions to make. The easy ones get made <coughs> by underlings. So only the hardest decisions come to the president and he needs all his willpower to make these tough decisions. So he says, well, I don't want to expend my willpower deciding what to wear or what to eat. Um, and so uh, just wearing the same, uh, the same kind of clothes every day, uh, that makes it easier. And I know uh, various other people like Zuckerberg, the guy at Facebook and, and so on, have adopted the same policy, conserving their energy uh, by not making these trivial decisions. All right, so choice is decision is depleting. Um, another finding was being active, showing what we call initiative, as you can be passive and just go along and do what people tell you, or you can stand up and say, no, no, I'll do something 
uh, different or I'll take action myself. This too changes when people are depleted. Uh, we, we finally had this research published a couple of years ago. This study was one of the, the first ones we did. I like it because it makes the point clearly. I think it's not in the published uh, version, but uh, it was there. Uh, as again, I borrowed the procedure from stress research. Uh, so we depleted people or not, and then showed them into a room with a computer um, and said, uh, okay, just follow the instructions on the computer for the next task. And the experimenter hits start and leaves the room. And so the, the subject uh, is sitting there at the computer and the computer was programmed to just go to blue screen and not do anything. And the measure was how long does the person sit there just staring at the screen, waiting for something to happen before they take the initiative to get up and leave and say, uh, the, the computer is not working. I'm just sitting there, nothing's happening. So as you see the attention regulated, the top one, that's the, the people who depleted uh, their willpower by controlling their attention in another task. They sat there twice as long uh, as uh, people in the control condition. So again, regulating their attention, exerting self-control, took something out of them that made them less likely to take initiative and take control of the situation. Um, all right, I'll skip uh, this because time's getting a little bit short. Uh, so uh, say a word or two about free will. I'm writing a book on that now. And, and by the way, if any of you have interesting comments or contributions on, on free will or new thoughts, uh, please do share them with me. I want my book to cover the latest things. Uh, so. If, if there is free will, this is it. If there's not free will, this is what is mistaken for it. But um, it is this style of decision-making and, and action control that that's the scientific problem. Uh, and so I think these four processes will make a good roadmap uh, for self-control, rational choice, planning, uh, and initiative. Oh, I didn't mention planning yet, but... Um, it's the same thing. Depleted people don't want to make plans uh, nearly as much. And uh, people with good self-control do a lot more planning. Um, so uh, those four uh, are there. And, you know, in the philosophical literature, a lot of the books on free will talk about self-control uh, and rational choice as important forms of free will. But they have no way of showing that those are related. But we do, because we have experiments, we can manipulate self-control and show that they're Cho choosing rational choices impaired, they're not as rational, or we can manipulate having them make rational decisions and show that their self-control is impaired. So we have the base to show those things have something uh, in common. All right, uh, planning, uh, I've already mentioned briefly and uh, time's running out all there. Uh, the uncertainty uh, is a, a different uh, issue. I'll leave that for now. Let me spend a few minutes talking about trait self-control. Uh, psychology always distinguishes between traits and states. Uh, so the, the depletion effect is a state effect. You're the same person, but your capacity for self-control, your willpower is more at some times than others. Your state changes. But we also know there are traits. Uh, certainly, if you think about your friends, some of them have more self-control than others. And that's, uh, that's quite uh, uh, apparent. Um, now, and, and we have this scale that measures uh, uh, personality differences in self-control. Uh, and I think uh, Alexandra helped uh, create the uh, Polish version of that. Um, uh, so I appreciated working with her uh, on that one. Now, um, one of the questions was, well, what happens do, when we deplete people? Do high self-control people or low trade self-control people show more of a depletion effect? <clears throat> you can make the theory either way. Maybe it's the people who have a lot of good self-control. They have farther to fall when they're depleted. Or maybe it's the people who don't have much that they will run out faster. And we ran many experiments and there's no difference. Uh, the high and low trait self-control people get depleted at the same rate. It seems to happen. Uh, so we're thinking those are just completely irrelevant. But then... I had another experience sampling study concerned with self-control where we had people report how they felt, including did they show the symptoms of, of ego depletion as they're going about their regular daily lives. So this is not in the laboratory, this is out in the world. And there, the feeling depleted was much more common among people with low trait self-control. So we wondered, why is that? You have one 
set of findings, a lot of findings in the laboratory showing depletion occurs the same regardless of whether you're high or low in trait self-control. And then one big study out in the world saying, wow, no, there's a whopper of a difference, a great big difference. Well, uh, to put these together, what I realized is that in the laboratory, everyone does the same task. Uh, and so everyone gets equally depleted, whether you're high or low self-control. Uh, so no interaction there. But outside, your life is more what you've made of it. And people with good self-control, their lives run much better. Uh, so uh, people with poor self-control get themselves into problems that then they have to solve. You know, they uh, miss the deadline for getting their work done, and then they have a problem that their boss is mad at them or there are other consequences there. They don't pay their bill on time, and then they have to pay extra uh, because they're late. Or they say something wrong to their, when they're angry at their romantic partner, and then they have a big fight, and then they have to deal with that. So there are a lot more problems in the life uh, of a person with low trade self-control, and that's why they get depleted much more common, even though the same task will deplete them uh, to the same amount. And what this means is that people with high self-control, they do not have more willpower, they just use it better. Um, how do they use it? Well, this uh, was another uh, somewhat surprising finding and changing a change in my, uh, my thinking. Um, it's uh, they use it to manage their habits. People with good traits, self-control, break bad habits and form good habits. And then life can run uh, along pretty smoothly uh, and automatically. Um, so uh, that's why life is easier and less stressful and more pleasant for them. Uh, so self-control works by way of habits. Uh, planning also, uh, which is in some ways conceptually related to uh, habits, uh, people with high self-control do more planning, uh, and so they know what they're supposed to do, and they waste less time, and they're more likely uh, to reach their goals. I see I'm about in the last few minutes uh, of the hour that we scheduled, <clears throat> so let me uh, quickly skip ahead uh, to uh, uh, the end. Um, so, as I said, we have a fair amount of research on glucose now. I'm the findings have been pretty consistent for us. Other people say they don't get it. I'm not as confident of these. I think anytime you're trying to mix the brain and the body, uh, the mind and the body rather, uh, mind and body, are, they're different sorts of phenomena and you're asking for trouble. Nonetheless, uh, we found in a great many of studies that uh, uh, depletion effects are wiped out if you give people a dose of glucose, which gives them more, uh, more energy. Um, uh, you can do it in a perfect double blind fashion. So we mix a glass of, of, of lemonade, either a diet uh, version or a, uh, uh, a version with sugar. Uh, and then we deplete people. Well, the sugar is energy. And so it contradicts, it wipes out the depletion effect. The diet drink, which tastes just as good and people are just as happy to have, uh, doesn't supply any energy. And so then they are, are still depleted. Um, so I'm going to skip through the glucose stuff. Um, so uh, in, in terms of how to put these all together, yes, there is a resource being depleted in the body. And yes, the mind acts as if there is one. But those two are only weakly related. The, the, basically, the mind, whatever regulates your, uh, your behavior, doesn't know how much energy there is. Uh, so it tries to estimate well, I guess I've used a lot of willpower energy, so maybe I should conserve. It doesn't really know exactly how much uh, you have. If more is coming in, then it thinks, okay, I can afford to expend more. Uh, but, uh, and again, this seems to be true uh, with physical muscles as well. Uh, the muscles do break down uh, physically, but that's a rather slow process. And the brain sends out signals of tiredness long before uh, the muscles are actually unable uh, to function. Um, so in recent years, there have been a variety of controversies uh, there. There's some people have put up uh, some alternate theories. Uh, other people failed to replicate it. And some even say that there's no, no such effect. Uh, one of these has to be completely wrong because you can't have a correct alternate explanation of something that doesn't exist. 
Uh, to me, the idea that it doesn't exist is just ridiculous with the amount of evidence that's uh, been accumulated, uh, let's say six to 800 significant findings and out in the world and there are more being published all the time. Uh, so I don't take that one that seriously. The alternate explanations I do take seriously and I, I've looked at these uh, and often borrowed some aspects of it. It's, we're at the point where there's so many different phenomena that if you really want to propose a new theory, it has to explain everything. Uh, people come along and say, oh, look, I got this. And then it explains a few uh, of the findings and it helps. Well, to me, that's something that means we need to build it into the theory, not throw out the other theory and, and replace it um, until we come up with something that can explain uh, all the phenomena, which is a, a great variety of it. Um, and so uh, um, some of the alternate theories there, uh, with glucose, uh, again, the experts in this said, you, you're not running out of glucose. The body has lots of glucose and maybe somebody who's starving, but a modern citizen in our, our society is you know, in danger. So it's really not that you've used up the fuel that the brain is running out of energy, rather it's selectively allocating it. Now those two are somewhat interrelated. You know, it's, when it's a limited resource, then you allocate much more carefully than it's unlimited. I've lived in many places around the world and how water is handled is quite different. Uh, I've lived in places where the desert and then water is precious and they all talk about uh, ways to conserve water and don't use it for this and don't waste it and so on. And other places where there's water all the time everywhere, then people are much more careless. So the selective allocation does, I think, fit with the idea that it's a limited resource um, and needs to be built in there. Yes, you're not running out. Uh, so anyway, I borrowed from that theory. There's another theory that it's it's not about a resource, it's just about motivation and attention, uh, that after you've exerted self-control on one task, you have less motivation to do self-control on another task. This is a lovely theory, but the evidence has just gone against it. Uh, no change in motivation uh, for the second task. Even if there were, you could incorporate that and say, well, when your energy is down, then you become more motivated to conserve what you have left. But uh, I'm, I'm kind of surprised it doesn't seem to happen very much. And then there are also people's beliefs about whether their willpower is limited. And if you change people's beliefs, you can change their behavior, at least uh, at the mild level when they're just slightly depleted. The more depleted they are, the less that happens. And again, that's akin to physical muscles uh, that uh, people start to get a little bit tired. If you can get them to believe, no, no, you've got lots of energy, uh, you can do it. Well, then they can continue to do well, at least for a while. When they get super tired, uh, telling them that they're not tired isn't, isn't, isn't likely uh, to work. So again, this is something that we need to add in as an additional level of understanding. Uh, to the theory, uh, but I don't think it replaces the whole theory. So anyway, let me summarize and conclude. Uh, it appears that an important part of the self uh, consists of a kind of energy resource uh, and uh, particularly useful for the, the higher level functions like self-control uh, and rational choice and the energy gets depleted and changes behavior. Uh, the depletion is not that the fuel is gone, that the energy is no longer there, uh, but rather the body knows it's expended some, and so it starts to conserve. And conservation is a natural response and probably was really important in our evolutionary past more than it is, <coughs> more than it is now. Uh, your capacity for self-control can be improved. And this, this is an important positive psychology thing to me. Uh, the, the two traits psychology has found that really make life better everywhere are intelligence and self-control. We've been trying to find ways to boost people's intelligence for over a century, and there's not much that, that really works there. It, it doesn't seem to, to be, but it does seem like we can improve people's self-control even when they're already uh, at least young adults. So uh, this is an important way in which psychology can make a lot of people's lives better by helping them achieve better self-control. As I said, we need to think both in terms of trait and state. Ego depletion is a fluctuating state as your capacity for self-control, uh, but you fluctuate around your baseline and some people are habitually uh, better than others. Um, it applies also to decision-making that uses the same energy store 
um, as well as uh, initiative being active rather than passive. Uh, and glucose, I'm not willing to say it's the same as uh, willpower, but there is clearly a, a link. Uh, we found it very reliably if you get a depletion effect uh, and uh, give half the people glucose, it wipes out uh, the effect among them or it's preserved among the others. Uh, so I think that's part of the story, but as I said, mixing mind and body uh, is always a challenge and, and that will remain difficult. So uh, that's uh, what I uh, had to say. I hope that gives you a reasonable overview of uh, how my thinking has developed uh, on these issues over the last uh, 25 years.